just by using these simple Adobe Lightroom tips, tricks, and techniques, you go from something like, okay, wow, that's not bad, pretty decent photograph, to something like, wow, that's crazy, that's dope, that's L. What's up, YouTube? It's your boy, BMAC. I'm getting crazy with the hand gestures on this channel lately. So all the time, I'm asked about my Instagram photos and my photography techniques to make my Instagram photos and because of how closely linked my photography skills are to my cinematography skills that you see on this channel through the daily videos I'm uploading Monday through Friday. Subscribe if you're new here. And so because of that crossover, the techniques I'm about to tell you about are very similar to video editing and it goes back and forth. Today, pretty much any photo you take with any camera could be edited and enhanced to look more professional through learning how to edit photos in Lightroom. Taking the picture, that's important, that's half the battle, but the second half of that battle is making your photos look sexy in Lightroom. And that's what we're gonna learn today. And while you're at it, if you have your phone next to you, feel free to log on to Instagram and go to at bmacadelic, or if you're on your computer, just open up a new web browser, go to instagram.com slash bmacadelic. There you'll see my Instagram feed. Feel free to shoot me a follow if you feel so inclined. Because there you'll actually be able to see firsthand the photographs that I'm putting through this process to see how I'm utilizing it and putting it to good use. So without further ado, let's get right to it with these Adobe Lit Room, I mean Lightroom, very, very corny joke. And show you some Adobe Lightroom tips, tricks, and techniques. Let's go. All right, so here's a final edited photograph of the Flatiron Building in New York City. Dope, dope building, by the way. If you ever go to New York City, definitely gotta check out this building. It looks fake, honestly, because of how cool the design is. I mean, that's besides the point. But anyway, this is what it looks like after I edited it all together. So let's go take a look at it. Let's reset it. This is without any edits placed on it. This is just straight up what the camera saw. And we're gonna be working with this sidebar here. This is all the main develop modules within Lightroom that is gonna actually enhance and edit the photograph we're working with. Very first thing I ever do before editing any photo is scrolling down to the lens correction section. Now the first thing I'll do is remove chromatic aberration, which you can't see in this photograph, but sometimes when you take a photograph and there's a lot of contrast between a lighter part of the image and a darker part of the image, you might see a purple hint on the side of some of the objects within your photo. I don't seem to have a problem with that with the Sony a6500. Maybe it's just a camera from God and that's just not a side effect. So even though this photograph doesn't have any chromatic aberration, I always select that option just to be safe. Now this one is really important. I'm gonna select enable profile corrections and down here you'll see lens profile. You have to click the make this is the actual lens you're using on your camera. So make, this is a Sigma 30 millimeter f1.4. You see the model right there, it happens to pop up. So you'll notice, it's very subtle, but on the top part of the image right here, and on the bottom part of the image right here. When you select this option, you see how it changes like that? When you take a photograph with a camera, it actually has a little bit of distortion depending on the lens that you use. The wider the lens, for example, the more of like a fisheye effect where you'll get heavy distortion on the sides. So you can actually correct that with a profile correction. This knows the lens that you're using and actually balances that out. You can see it noticeably on just this part of the building becoming less rounded less bulgy. I always select enable profile corrections and pick the lens because that little difference goes a long way. And it just looks more natural. Like that's what you would actually see with your eye if you were looking at the flat iron building. Now that's the first thing I do because that'll also fix a little bit of vignetting, which is like darkness around the corners. We'll talk more about that later, but that's why I like to do that first. The very next thing is checking the white balance. Now you can set the white balance in your camera to actually be custom, like 5,500 Kelvin or whatever you choose. Since I'm running and gunning it and I'm just snapping a lot of photographs wherever I am, I select auto white balance, but if you're shooting raw, it doesn't really matter because you could fix the white balance afterwards. But the white balance is basically how warm or how cool your photograph actually looks. You can see on this bar right here, this is the white balance section. By dragging this all the way to the left, it looks super cold. And then on the other end of it is super warm. It just looks like it's an extremely hot photograph. Color temperature, kind of makes sense, right? Temperature. So usually my shots out of camera are pretty good. That looks a little cool to me. So usually I will click auto. Now what I won't adjust the tint. I don't really have a good eye when it comes to the tint. It's basically just the green and magenta that's in your photograph. Whatever it suggests is actually usually what I just keep. But then I'll manually adjust the color temperature to kind of suit my taste. That's a little too warm, that's a little too cold. It's at 7,500, I'm gonna go right beneath that, probably like right around there. The very next thing I do is actually adjust the crop and the aspect ratio. I'll click the crop tool right there. You can also click this lock if you wanted to just freehand the crop like that. See how that's kind of messing up your aspect ratio? You could click this lock and it will lock in the actual aspect ratio so you'll make sure no matter what way you crop it, 
it's the right dimensions. On Instagram, I always do four by five. When it's a taller photo and not a wide photo. If it's a wide photo, I probably do something like 16 by nine, so going the other way, something like that. But because it's a tall photo, I'm rolling with four by five. I'll also adjust the rotation to make it look good. Now I'm looking right here, but that does look a little bit like it's leaning left too much. But if you wanted to kind of just leave it up to the computer, you could always select this tool right here and actually drag the plane on which you want to straighten the image by. Now, just by doing that, looking at this photograph, it looks pretty good. There it is. Now, once we have that set, I will go over here, and now we're gonna start messing with the exposure. But I'll often click auto just to see what it's thinking. Let Lightroom decide how underexposed or overexposed the image is. Now, that's saying 0.8. Now, that looks pretty good, but I never really like to just go with the auto setting. I like to tweak it myself. So I'm gonna undo that. Auto said 0.8. I usually go right underneath that 0.78 and I can adjust the contrast as needed. Right now, I don't really see a need to mess with that because I kind of control that with the settings I'm about to go over down here. Highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. Next thing I'll do is I'll drag down the highlights. Now this bar, this highlights slider, this controls the amount of detail you're able to see in the brighter parts of the image, the highlights. By dragging that baby all the way down to the left, you could really start to see the details in the clouds start to come out like that sometimes it could kind of take away from the pop of the brighter parts of the image so I might not bring that all the way down usually it's pretty far down but this time I do think it's gonna be right around like there like 95 ish that looks good shadows is the same exact thing but with you guessed it the shadows of the image the details in the shadows the darker parts if I zoom in right here by the way how crazy is that how crazy is the quality and the sharpness of this shot from that far away I could literally zoom in and read the writing on the side here if I wanted to that just blows my mind. This is a great camera, but I digress. Going back to the image here, the shadowy parts of the image, like maybe right here, see the shadow part of this window or the shadowy parts of the underside of the building on the top there. By adjusting the shadows, you could kind of bring out details there. Now you could go all the way down with the highlights and all the way up with the shadows for a very HDR, high dynamic range looking photo. And you could always bump up the contrast to kind of level that out too if you wanted. Some people love that look. It's a little too bright and unrealistic for me, but if you like that, you could go with that. I usually take the shadows up to the point where I just start to see a little bit more detail in the darker parts of the image. Right there's good. And to me, that already looks so much better. You have detail in the side of the building, you have detail in the dark parts and the bright parts, you see the clouds in the background. It's already looking like a masterpiece. Next thing up is the whites and the blacks. Now I kind of look at these settings as basically adding more whites to the image and adding more blacks to the image if you take these sliders to the right or taking them away if you slide them to the left. Let me tell you what I mean. So whites, if you drag the whites to the right, you can see it's adding more whites or appears to add more whites to the image. And with the blacks, if you crush the blacks a little bit, it's starting to make the blacks darker. So it kind of makes the whites whiter and the blacks blacker. That's kind of like the easy way of looking at it. What I will do is I'll hold down the option key and that once you click on the slider, will go black on the image, and you, as you start to slide it, you'll start to see colors pop up. These colors coincide with the actual exposure of the image, and as we get too far to the right, the more colors you see, if I take my hand off the option key, you'll see we have just we have totally lost detail on the left and right of this building. So to counteract that, what I do is just slide the slider all the way to the right until I just start seeing colors and stop there, which looks pretty good. Same with the black. Option, hold down the slider, Drag it to the left until I just start seeing blacks pop through. If I drag this all the way to the left, those black areas you see right here, that means there's absolutely no detail there. That's just pure black. We probably don't want that. So I hold down the option key, go to the left until I just start seeing a little bit of detail and boom. That to me looks like a well-composed shot. It's got good exposure, good whites, good blacks. You see the details and the highlights and the shadows. It's looking good. But to take it up another notch, here's what we're gonna do. Moving down here to the tone curve. Now I could spend an entire video just talking about the tone curve itself, because there's so much you could do to play around with it and make your photo look totally different, cool, surreal, whatever you're going for. But this is probably what you'll see. You could actually adjust the tone curve itself manually by clicking this button right here, and then you could place dots and you know, adjust it that way and start doing some funky things here. But if you're just starting to get started out, if you're just starting to start to get if you're just starting out with the tone curve, I would make sure you see this right here, and then you could actually just adjust the highlights specifically like that. And as you drag that down, you're starting to see more details, even more so in the sky. The lights, same thing. Now, if you bring that down too much, we start to get a little bit funky looking on this side of the building. So it's probably not something we want. It just looks kind of surreal. I like to keep a level of realness 
in my photos. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the lights down. You can do the same thing with the darks. I'm actually gonna crush those just a little bit, get a little bit of contrast back. And that looks pretty good. So just by those little adjustments, toggle those on and off. Subtle, subtle differences that all add up to be a much better looking photo. Moving on down here to the HSL tab section box. Whatever you want to call it. I don't ever touch color or black and white. I just go through HSL. Hue is actually going to change the hue of specific colors within your photo. So we have just basically blue and orange that we're working with here. So back in like January, February of this year when it was ice cold outside, I kind of just was taking a lot of boring winter photographs and to kind of make those look a little bit more interesting, I was actually changing my blues to be more purple which kind of fit with the feeling at the time. Like everything seemed just like blue and purple and cold and dead. And But you could go over here to the hue tab and you could actually start messing with the hue of the colors. So if I was doing that purple theme like I had earlier this year for the winter, I would drag my blues over here very far to the right to give it a very purple-ish hue. Or you could do the same by going the opposite direction, get like a teal look. And you could do that for every color within your image. You know, you can make the building look a lot more red, a lot more yellow. The more you mess around with those though, obviously the less realistic your photo is gonna become. So just kind of take that with a grain of salt. Now I held off up here on presence for a second. We are gonna change a couple things in here, but I wanted to point this out first. You get to control the specific saturation of colors within the image down here on this tab. So say I wanted the blues to be more saturated, but I don't want the oranges to be more saturated within this image. You could do that down here by adjusting the blues. You could get them more saturated by bringing these to the right. As you notice, the rest of the image is not impacted. Because up here, if you start getting too saturated, it just looks like someone took a big bucket of paint and just threw it on your photograph. And that just looks, that looks like, you know, doesn't look right. Something's wrong. So instead of adjusting the saturation up here, I'll usually adjust it down here first. And then I'll use the vibrant setting up here, which actually brings out the richness of colors within your photo without oversaturating it. Here's what I mean. If I take this all the way down, you'll get a little bit of color, but it's very dull, hence, Vibrance. You slide this up to the other end, and it's very vibrant without being too overly saturated, but it still kind of looks unrealistic. So you need a balance between these two. I usually bring the vibrance up to around, I don't know, 10-ish. I might take the saturation down a little bit too, just like a tad. Give it more of like a cinematic type look. Only a little bit, probably like three ticks. That seems good. Now the other thing while we're on it in presence is clarity. This you could drag it all the way to the right, which looks very similar to how every single photo when I first started using Instagram looks. As you can see, if you bring it all the way to the right, it gives it like a very HDR look. If you bring it all the way to the left, it just looks kind of very dreamy. It kind of looks like those comic book filters from the photo booth on your MacBook, right? But anyway, I like to bring out, because this brings out detail and the contrast in the details. I'm going to bring this up. Usually I bring it up to around like 13, 14. Yeah, it looks pretty good. So going back down here, now that we understand saturation, vibrance, clarity, luminance is actually how bright certain parts of your image are according to colors. So say I really wanted these blues to be a little bit more dark and, and bring out more richness, you could take down the luminance of those colors. Now, the more you go, that just looks, that looks like a very bad Photoshop job, right? You could adjust with these tabs, however, the amount of blueness, if you will, in your photo, as well as like the certain parts of your image. That looks pretty good. That looks realistic, yet still kind of like, whoa, this guy knows what he's doing. You can do the same thing with the oranges and the other colors within your photo. I'm gonna actually make these a little darker, get a little more detail in there. The oranges look good right around there. And we don't have to worry about the other colors because there's no magentas, there's no purple, so we won't even bother. Moving along to split toning. Now, I don't do a whole lot with split toning, but this is where you could start to add like specific colors to certain parts of the image according to highlights and shadows. If I wanted the clouds to be a little bit more like purplish, for instance, you could pick a color like this, which is, I guess, not purple, red. And then you adjust the and saturation. You I'm gonna drag this bar slightly. And as you can see, it gives just a slight little red hue to the highlights. And you can do the same for the shadows if you wanted them to be, well, I don't know, green. I don't know, this is a disgusting looking photo in my honest opinion, but if someone likes that, to each his own. If I wanted those to be green, I could also adjust that and adjust the saturation, so. Weird combination here, but you have a little, if you can see by toggling this, you have a little bit of purple in the highlights and a little bit of green in the shadows. So I don't do a whole lot with split toning. You could try split toning to kind of get your own kind of look, but personally, not something I do. Down here, sharpening. Now this is important. If we zoom in again on this image, I will take sharpening up. This is basically just makes it look crisp. If you go too far, you'll notice the whole image just looks too sharp, just very digital-like. So you don't want to do that. What I usually do to figure out where to bring this to, 
It's usually around like 35 maybe, but you zoom in real far and then you can adjust this. And I will usually bring this up. You're probably not gonna be able to see this on YouTube, but say we're looking at this window. If I'm adjusting the sharpening, I will bring it up to just below the point where you see how you see all those like details. Again, not sure if you can see that, but I will bring the sharpening up to just before you start to see those details and artifacts in the photograph. That's usually the perfect level of sharpening. That's a little bit too much. Probably gonna bring it down a little bit. Yeah, right around 35 is usually where I have it. Zoom out, that looks pretty good. Radius, you're gonna hold down the option key and again, toggle your slider here for radius. Now you don't want this all the way to left, you don't want it all the way to right. I usually in between 0.5 and 1.5. And I will usually bring this to the point where you just start to see lines better in the actual outline. If we zoom in more, you'll get a better idea of what that looks like. That's a little bit too much. If you ever have like a very thick, you don't want it to look very contrasty. You want it just before that. Like I'm gonna probably have it around eh, 0.9. That looks pretty good for sharpness. Masking, again, hold down the option key and you're gonna slide this all the way until you just see the lines you want to affect. Now you'd be surprised how many times I max this out at 100. This time it's gonna be a little bit less. It's gonna be at 92. The goal of masking is basically to select the part of the image or parts of the image that you want sharpened and not the rest. That's why you'll see black and the white is what's affected here. You only want the white lines to come up on the parts of the image you really would like to sharpen, which makes sense. Like I don't really want overly sharp clouds. I want those to be dreamy and kind of just as they are. Noise reduction is another one that's usually around 25, but you could zoom into a part of the image that's not very detailed, like over here. In the sky, this usually helps a lot. I'm telling you, the magic number usually is around 25. And you probably, again, won't be able to see this on YouTube, but it does take out just a little bit of the noise that exists because of the sharpening, and boom. Sharpening set, doesn't look noisy. This is a pretty good looking photo. Now the very last thing I'll do is I will actually give it a vignette. This is what we were talking about before. When you apply the lens corrections, it will actually take away some of the vignette that your lens might have caused. I, you, now if you had just like a landscape photograph or there wasn't a specific part of the image you wanted to kind of bring attention to, it's just like the whole thing is kind of the subject of the photo. You can just go down here and post crop vignetting. You can bring this to the left or you can also bring it to the right to get a white vignette. There's one photograph on my Instagram feed where I did a white vignette and I regret it. To this day, it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. Go and comment on it, at BMacadelic. If you could find the photograph I used a white vignette on, it's the only one on my entire Instagram feed. I don't like it. I don't suggest white vignettes because that just kind of looks very postcardish to me. Doesn't look realistic. I always have my vignettes be slightly black. I will usually go to the point where you could just barely make out a harsh line. Like that is obviously way overdone, but I will usually go that far and then undo it to the point where you can't really tell that you have a vignette, but enough to bring attention to the middle and boom that looks pretty good and there it is that it just gives it that a vignette gives it a nice little bit of movement it really brings your eye to the subject of your photo but if you really want to get involved in that that's the quick way of doing it the other way of doing it is by going up here the specific tool name is radio filter you click on that and you basically go to the center part of your subject which obviously is just the building but you go to the center and you will drag down and you'll basically create your own vignette. Basically, I will adjust these sides. Hold down the option key once again. If you don't hold down the option key, it's going to affect the both sides. If you hold down the option key, it's only going to affect one side. And I will set this up to kind of customize it in a way. Rotate it a little bit. Bring this down. Bring this up. And then I will adjust the exposure. Now this is essentially a mask, which is doing the same thing that the post crop vignetting is doing down here. But you have a little bit more control over this and I just like it. It's a little bit better. You could also mess around down here. That's the way I do it for vignettes. I just feel like you have more control over it. It could actually end up being a better photograph as a result. You control where the movement of the eye is going to be when someone's looking at your photograph. And that looks pretty good. You could also kind of tweak that down here by adjusting the midpoint and maybe the roundness and all that. But again, I just found it easier to really just use the radial filter and do it myself. The last thing I might do is go back up to the exposure tab and see if there's anything else I want to fix. Like I think I might want to bring up the highlights just a tad, maybe adjust the shadows a little bit, maybe the contrast. But after that, take a look. Wow, that's it. Check out the before in the after. Just by using these simple Adobe Lightroom tips, tricks, and techniques, you go from something like, okay, wow, that's not bad, pretty decent photograph, to something like, wow, that's crazy, that's dope, that's ill. From here, all that's left to do is to export this bad girl. And once she's done exporting, you could send her over to your phone, from which point you could put her into Visco, or you could just open her up in Instagram, use one of Instagram filters. But by using these Adobe Lightroom tips, tricks, and techniques, you can make your photo pop. And no matter what filter you're using these days, it'll look that much better, like an actual professionally taken and edited 
photograph. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked it. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'm going to go upload this baby to the gram. There we go.